Welcome again, everybody, with a new case. Uh, before we start, the case is mainly dedicated for radiology residents and more senior audience. However, junior audience, please stick around. Uh, I will try to explain a few basics that would be useful as we go through the case, uh, as well as some theory that would be interesting to both parties, seniors and juniors. Now, this is a female patient in her late 40s. Uh, she has a swelling that she could feel over the right back of her lower chest upper abdominal wall and you could see the abnormality here the ct is with contrast and as we're looking at the uh, abnormality in the uh, right posterior chest slash abdominal wall you notice that the abnormality has this uh, soft tissue density that's similar to the density of muscles but also notice that the lesion is heterogeneous in appearance. Now, one thing to point out is the heterogeneity is a result of uh, fat density, these black areas that are similar to the density of subcutaneous fat. So these black densities here that you see are fat densities within the soft tissue abnormality that we just described. So that's one point to keep in mind. Be very meticulous when you see a soft tissue lesion on uh, CT imaging and try to look for any other densities, since different densities mean different components. Here, you see this bright focus that we'll talk about later, but you could tell that this bright focus is equal to the density of bone. So it's something calcific, right? Now, if you go lower down, you'll probably see another one here as well. When we see soft tissue tumors in adults, one of the concerns would be that of a malignant tumor such as sarcoma. And if the lesion contains fat, you're always thinking about a liposarcoma, but this is not the case. Let's continue with MRI. Here's an MRI of the same patient. Uh, for those who followed us previously, you guys know that uh, a T2-weighted image has fluid being bright, such as fluid that you see here within the CSF. Now, the lesion on this T2 image uh, shows that the soft tissue component is uh, slightly heterogeneous, but it's uh, mainly um, iso to hyper intense compared to adjacent muscle. You tend to compare those to muscles when you talk about intensity on MRI. So that's uh, fact number one. Fact number two, you also see the density of uh, fat in between the soft tissue lobules. Now, this is the other sequence known as T1, where fluid in the uh, CSF uh, spaces looks black. The lesion is seen in a similar fashion with the uh, soft tissue components showing what uh, is iso to hypo intense compared to adjacent muscles and uh, internal bright fat intensity that's similar to the intensity of fat seen in the subcutaneous areas or inside the abdomen. One of the uh, tricks to use when you look at soft tissue tumors is to ask the uh, technologist to uh, place a marker since sometimes they're very difficult unless the patient tells you exactly where the abnormality is. Whether it's a T1 or a T2, you could apply what we call fat saturation. So Fat usually appears uh, bright on T1 and on T2. You could suppress the fat signal so it appears dark. You could see the fat inside the abdomen looks black here. You could see the fat in the subcutaneous area looks black. And the fat component inside the lesion is also darkened. So on fat suppression, there is suppression of fat confirming the uh, fatty composition that we talked about on both CT and MRI sequences. Now, one thing to keep in mind that calcifications are usually easier to see on a CT scan than MRI. You could miss them on MRI if they're small, and that's what's happening here. Uh, for radiology residents, gradient echo sequences would typically help since you could see blooming at the areas of calcifications. Now, we'll look at the images on a T1 
fat suppressed axial sequence with intravenous contrast. You could see that the kidney is bright here. Look at what happens to the lesion. You have intense heterogeneous enhancement of the soft tissue components. You could see that here. You also have a few small dilated surrounding vessels as well. To summarize what we found, it's a soft tissue abnormality in the posterior chest wall in between muscles. The abnormality has soft tissue components that intensely enhance on MRI after giving intravenous contrast. The lesion has also internal fat density in addition to the few calcific densities that we saw on the CT scan. Here's the CT again showing the calcific focus in a better way. Now, calcifications in lesions could happen due to several uh, reasons. However, if the calcifications are rounded in or outside a lesion, one of the things that you could think about, and this is an important teaching point, is to think about a flibolith. Flibolith means calcification in a vascular structure, namely a vein. So these vein stones or fliboli are characteristic of a vascular abnormality. And this is where our teaching point begins. Given the summarized findings of soft tissue, intense enhancement, fat, and fliboliths, the lesion is most likely that of a vascular malformation. And we'll talk about vascular mal malformations in uh, more details uh, in the subsequent posts. So vascular malformations, a very important topic, whether it's in practice or in exam settings. Now, despite that, we don't see these cases uh, so frequently. So uh, we as uh, radiologists, uh, especially residents, tend to forget about uh, how to describe those. Uh, and uh, the classification is a bit confusing. When it comes to terminology, many residents and trainees think that it's all about hemangiomas and arteriovenous malformations, but the uh, discussion is more complex than that. It's not that difficult, but it's more complex. And the right classification would lead to the right treatment. The opposite is also true. If you call something an AVM and it's not, that would lead the clinician in a wrong pathway. So let's talk about those in a bit of uh, detail in the uh, following section. When we say vascular anomalies, typically books divide those into two big categories. They divide this into a vascular tumor versus a vascular malformation. A vascular tumor, which could be benign or malignant, um, is a different discussion, but it includes something relevant. Uh, it includes hemangioma. So hemangiomas could be considered benign tumors under this category. Okay, for uh, radiology residents, another example of something that could be malignant is a hemangioendothelioma. When it comes to vascular malformations, one of the things that you could think about uh, in an easy way is that uh, the um, vascular connections are simply an artery that connects to a vein and there is intervening capillaries, so artery capillary veins. Abnormalities of these components could lead to various vascular malformations. The most important point in today's uh, discussion is the following. Vascular malformations could either have very high flowing blood or could be very slow flowing uh, uh, lesions. And that's why they are classified into two big categories that decide management. The first category is high flow vascular malformations. The second category is slow flow vascular malformations. High flow vascular malformations, which uh, are obviously not today's case, are arteriovenous malformations, arteriovenous fistulas, and some books would include hemangiomas. Now, with these high flow abnormalities, you'd expect to see lots of blood vessels that show you the signs of high flow on any imaging modality, whether it's an ultrasound, a CT, or MRI. MRI in particular would show you, this is for residents, would show you these vessels as signal voids, okay? And these are also easily seen on T2 or gradient echo images. Now, these high flow malformations are AVMs, which is a dark communication between the artery 
and the vein via abnormal nidus, so you don't have the normal capillary bed. Or could be AVF fistula, where there is direct communication between the artery and vein immediately. And then you have hemangiomas, which and then you have hemangiomas, which are a different uh, discussion of their own. So we'll keep hemangiomas for a different uh, case, uh, since it's not today's uh, scope uh, of interest. The slow flow categories of uh, vascular malformation includes uh, venous malformation, lymphatic malformation, capillary malformation, or a combination of uh, any of those. For example, a venal lymphatic malformation. To simplify the discussion, the important ones when it comes to imaging and uh, where a radiologist has an important role in deciding the extension and the type of lesion would be those of vascular malformations and lymphatic malformations. The other one, which is a capillary malformation, is the your classic uh, uh, birthmark, which uh, we typically call a port or a nevus. Uh, so let's concentrate on the venous and lymphatic ones. Lymphatic malformations are basically dilated bags of uh, lymphatic drainage. They could uh, have small or large cysts, which we call micro versus macrocystic uh, types. And uh, this is what we used to call in the old days in pediatric patients a cystic hygroma. This is an old name. So that's the one that you've known as a student as a cystic hygroma. Now, these are dilated cystic structures, and that's going to have an implication on the way uh, we see it on imaging. When it comes to imaging, lymphatic malformations could show a single or multiple cysts that are separated by septations. They'll show you fluid density or intensity or an, on MRI. They typically show no enhancement, and if they do enhance, the enhancement is very minimal, and it's that of rim-like enhancement of the uh, capsule or the septations. They don't have any feature to suggest a high flow. For example, you will not see signal voids residents. You will not see signal voids on a uh, MRI study. There's slow flow, so the uh, recurrence rate is usually less than what you see with the high flow lesions after treatment, and typically the treatment is sclerotherapy. So that's for lymphatic malformations in a nutshell. Now for venous malformations, which are basically abnormal veins in size, drainage, or formation, uh, they typically show you on imaging modalities clear intense enhancement, whether heterogeneous or homogeneous. They also have fat located in between the abnormal venous uh, structures, and they may commonly show you calcifications related to flippoli. So by that, you know that our lesion here is actually a venous malformation, and let's look at that quickly again. So again, the abnormality has soft tissue components with internal flibuli and internal fat components. The lesion also shows intense enhancement, as we saw on the MRI, and that all fits with a venous malformation. Now, the fact that you have flippoli and enhancement goes against a lymphatic malformation, and they totally look different than the high-flow vascular malformation we talked about. They are not AVMs, AVFs, or hemangiomas. Sclerotherapy could also be performed for venous malformation. Now, to give you the difference between this and what happens with high-flow lesions, high-flow lesions are typically either treated by endovascular embolization by different materials, with or without surgical uh, intervention. So it's a different kind of treatment uh, all over. To summarize, vascular malformations should be correctly identified as either high flow versus slow flow. High flow lesions such as arteriovenous malformations, arteriovenous fistulas, and maybe hemangiomas can be identified on imaging by seeing evidence of high flowing blood such as signal voids on MRI. Slow flow lesions would have none of that, and those slow flow lesions include venous malformations, lymphatic malformations, or a combination of others. Now, lymphatic malformations would never enhance. They could have cysts. They might have enhancing septations and walls. They could have fluid levels. That's versus venous malformations where there is clear enhancement. They may contain fat and flippoli. And the treatment of both is basically, typically either sclerotherapy and sometimes it might be conservative. 
So that's to summarize today's discussion. Hopefully it was useful and let's see you with more cases later.